this available. I will make this available uh, through, I'll, I'll post a link in our Slack channels for people. Um, and I'll send out an email as well with the, the link to the recording following this. So welcome everyone to this workshop. I'm really happy you could all make it. Um, and I am going to start out with the, uh, oh my God. That I'm going to be interrupted throughout by pets. So, sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Um, that was the cat needing to get in. So, I just want to give a little bit of background on the fact that this is Neotoma 2 and why we are uh, using Neotoma 2 and not. Uh, just going back to the original Neotoma R package. So this is going to give you a little bit of history as well about Neotoma. Uh, basically, we had, I think in 2015, we published the first R package that used Neotoma web services. Um, everything on Neotoma is served through Penn State University. Uh, we had the database on a server in the cloud there that was running on Windows, um, but we stopped using that server and that specific database in June of 2020. And ultimately, the web service that, that provided all that data crashed in about 2022. Um, so that old R package is no longer supported and I, it's not on CRAN anymore. It's It's been taken down. So people using it are using a legacy version that, that no longer serves data. Part of the reason we did that was because we moved the database to a new database system and we rebuilt the service that provides data over the web. Um, the other thing we wanted to do was when we originally wrote the R package, we didn't use, uh, so I, those of you who are, are familiar with R might know about the tidyverse and packages like dplyr. Uh, we chose not to use that initially because it was a relatively new thing. Um, and so that's now eight years ago and it, it is really something that's much more common uh, on the web, uh, sorry, in R. So uh, we now really try to model the same kind of data structure that Neotoma uses. So those of you who have seen presentations about Neotoma uh, might be familiar with this idea that Neotoma is structured around sites that have one or more collection units inside them. So a lake might have multiple core sites, which would each be individual collection units. And then within those individual collection units, we would have individual data sets. So a data set for charcoal, a data set for pollen, a data set for plant macro fossils. Um, and then each of those data sets would have one or more samples. Uh, down core, for example. And the same thing applies to archaeological sites, where you might have an archaeological site with one or more uh, pits in it. Uh, each of those pits might have a pollen data set and a plant macrofossil data set or a, um, a phytolith data set. And then there might be multiple samples through the depth of that pit. Um, the other thing that we're really trying to do and, and we've been working on uh, lately is working to support data upload through the R package. And so the idea there is that we want people to be able to use this R package as part of a workflow that starts with data collection um, so that people can start working on their data sets in an analytical workflow as they're even counting things. They can just keep adding the samples to their record, pull in records from Neotoma, look at them interactively, and then ultimately push that data up to Neotoma. <clears throat> so, uh, and then there's better data validation in the R package itself. Uh, and we're using this tidyverse style of programming. And you'll see that as we work uh, through the examples. 
so the other thing we're doing too is uh, I hope that you will see as we work through this that there's much better and more extensive documentation for this R package. Uh, we have been working on these workshops and making those available uh, interactively. And um, we're working more closely with the actual database manual. And so there's a link here. You all should have a link to these slides. Um, and then more information is returned about the data objects as well. So we're actually in this new R package, you're getting more metadata uh, to help with your analysis. And so that is it. So uh, does anyone have any questions about the difference between this package and the original R package? That's great. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we are going to start I'm just going to copy this and paste it into the R uh, into the Zoom chat. If you look in your uh, oop, okay, so if you look in uh, the agenda, but also this link here. So what we wanted to do for you is provide an opportunity to use R and the R package without having to worry about installation problems on your own computer. And so uh, if you use this link, it will start an instance. Oh, it will start an instance of our studio in your computer. I'm uh, sorry, in your browser. And so while everyone gets that started, oh, sorry, I see that I have a, the link for the, oh, the, the, the next link in the agenda is just misspelled. <laughs> so if you go to it, uh, if you go to it, you will see. It's missing the H in the word workshop. So that's simple workflow link. You can just add an H in workshop. So I'm going to go and share my screen again. All right. Uh, while I am presenting, Socorro is also on this call, and uh, if you have questions or are running into problems, please feel free to uh, message in the chat, and we can try to solve those while we go. But also feel free to unmute and um, okay, unmute. I'm already, I'm already going to be slow. What's <laughs> what's uh, where's the link to get to this page? I I just I shared it in the chat. So it should be it it should be here. We're working on this simple workflow in the agenda. I'm there, thanks. But I misspelled uh I this link is uh if you actually click on it, uh it um that it that should say current workshop. And when you actually click on it, it should have an H in the word. So I <laughs> made some mistakes. Um, but yeah, I've, I've shared it in the Zoom. So this document uh, we made using our markdown. It, uh, it is completely reproducible. Uh, you, you can come back to this and copy paste and all the code will run and you'll see throughout here that we have these code examples and then you can click this result tab and see what the result actually looks like. So what we wanted to do is not only uh, because we recognize that some of you don't have as much experience using R, uh, we want to work through this with you in a way that will support you 
but also in a way that you can return to this later on when you have some time to work on it yourself and 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 copy paste the code and then see exactly what you should be getting. Um, there are some things that we do in this uh, code that you'll see come up from time to time. So one of these is you'll see this format where we have a name. These are package names. So in this case, this is dev tools and then two colons. So what this means is I am calling a function in R from this package. So generally, if we load a package by using this library command, we then have access to all the functions in that package. Um, this is just a shorthand to say I am using this function from this package. Um, it's helpful sometimes if, uh, if you have packages if you have functions that are that are in multiple packages um, and and you'll see it from time to time in this code. Uh, but in general, it'll work. So uh, the other thing we've done is you should have this R Studio server. I hope you all were able to open that up. Um, and when we get in here, you will also see and, and this link will be available to you after the workshop. It'll always be around. And you'll see it'll have this, here's your R interface. And so I can type like one plus one and I get my answer is two. Uh, we can do library Neotoma two, which will load the library for us. Uh, but you'll also see that I have a panel up here, which will show me all the different variables that I have. And then uh, over here, I have a set of files that are linked. So there's like a data file here. Um, I'm gonna go back up. This is my simple workflow. So this RMD file is an R markdown file, and it is the file that made this web page. So again, you can come back to this at any time and you will have access to all this code and be able to run it. So I'm going to run through these next sections here where we do a simple site search um, and uh, we'll do some of this. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna run through this going back and forth between this web page which is the code and then the code itself here so you can see i have introduction this document is intended to act as a primer blah 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 and then here is the same thing introduction this document is intended to act as a primer so for those of you that haven't seen our markdown before i really like it uh, i think it's a really nice way to integrate writing text and writing code at the same time. Um, you can in our studio or whatever uh, development environment you use, you can just add these three tick marks and I can go to a line of code and hit control enter. Oh, there you go. I can hit control enter and it will, uh, it will send the code to Oh, there, I need to do that. It will send the code to uh, my actual terminal. Um, it didn't work here because uh, you can see that it's based, this, uh, this message is telling me Neotoma hasn't changed since the last time I installed it, so we don't have to worry about installing it. And, so, and then I loaded this. So we're going to start out by doing some simple searching. I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we can do in the package. Um, but is everyone okay right now in terms of where we're at? Seems like it. Okay, 
everyone's been able to get up the web page and the R Studio server. If you're having problems, no, I have not. I don't know. Okay. Where Does did this Jay? Did this link that I posted in the chat work for you to get our studio going? And here is the web page. Yeah, I got the workflow, um, the the studio thing. Um, I get Finder and accessible. Oh, is anyone else getting that? Uh, I'm also getting an error message about trying to yeah. load the package. Is that what you said? Sorry, uh, an error message about opening binder? No, sorry. Just with the new to two package. In when you're in binder? No, so when you're in no. the browser? No, I'm not in the browser. I'm in our studio. Okay. Can can you do it from the browser? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and then we can work through because then then otherwise we can work through uh <clears throat> okay, thank you so much. I was able to solve my problem. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, let's let's keep things in the browser just because, and then uh, if you're having problems installing this later, um, either contact us through email or um, on the Slack workspace that we have. Thank you. Okay. So. The idea behind the R package is basically to allow people to search for data, build these data sets in memory, and then do their analysis. Uh, you'll see that there are links in here uh, for contacts as well in this section, getting help with Neotoma that you can get to here. Um, I'm just going to talk, I'll, I'll come back to the site searches, uh, but I'm just going to talk about the structure of objects. Um, and so let me just open image and the new tab. Okay, so in the new Neotoma, so in, in Neotoma itself, like I said before, we have sites that can contain one or more collection units. Those collection units can contain one or more data sets. They have chronologies. And then ultimately, uh, if you see here, they have samples. And so in the R package, we treat data objects in the same way. We basically say, when you do a search, whether by site name, whether by location, um, by the taxa that might be in that site, you are going to get a single object from that search that contains one or more sites. You can then plot them, you can do, you can see how many you got, you can get a summary of those objects. What you can then do is you can then add the data sets to those objects. So the, the thing about Neotoma is that the data is really big. Um, there's a lot of metadata because we have a lot of different users that have a lot of different requirements. And so if you downloaded all of Neotoma, for example, uh, you'd be looking at somewhere on the order of 500 megabytes, um, which is a lot of information to pull into R and, and work with. Um, and so what we've tried to do is we've tried to give people the metadata that they ask for explicitly and then allow them to filter through records. So we don't give you everything all at once. We allow you to sort of build up the objects that you're going to work with. And so in this simple workflow, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to show you that we can pull in some information and get this sort of spatial information. And then 
we can filter down, get smaller subsets of that data, and then ultimately work on plotting it up and doing some basic analysis. So I'm just going to... So if we are in this binder on our browser now, I can type in library Neotoma 2. And so this is going to add the library to our environment. And now I can do a search. And so let me, uh, so surprise, uh, surprise lake. Is it a lake, Jay, or is it a pond? I think it's a lake, uh, is one that my PhD advisor and Jay's PhD advisor uh, studied. And so I'm going to call get sites, and I'm going to use the flag site name. And so in Neotoma, uh, in the API and in the R package, we use the percent sign as a wild card. And so just like in the documentation, we're going to see this will look for anything. So this will that uses the word surprise in it. So this will find lake surprise. If there is a lake surprise, this will find surprise lake. This will find surprise cave, whatever. And so you'll see now I have in my environment tab this new object called surprise. I can look at it here. Uh, by just typing into the console. And you can see I've got Surprise Lake, I've got Surprise Cave, and then a couple other Surprise Lakes that are in different locations. It gives me the latitude and longitudes, and it gives me the altitude. There are some other functions that we have access to. So surprise just sort of gives me a pretty simple rundown of what's in this site object. I can also see if I use summary surprise, I can see again the site names, the collection units, and then the kinds of data sets that I have access to. So I have a pollen data set, a geochronologic data set, which would be like the radiocarbon dates for that record. There is at this surprise cave, a vertebrate fauna record. I have a water chemistry and diatom surface sample data set, uh, and then a water chemistry and diatom data set. And I can plot these using the plot leaflet function. And this gives me an interactive object. So I can actually like scroll over, I can zoom in if I want, and I can click on it and go to the Neotoma Explorer. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with Explorer. Um, that should, boop. There we go. So this is going to pop up. Uh, I had to right click. Um, and I assume that's because we're doing this in the browser, but I had to right click, but this will now give me the site and I can actually click on it and get more information about the site if I want it. So I can look at the chronologies and, and all that kind of stuff. And I can look at the diagrams if I want to. So we want to be able to supply, like provide you with as much information as we can early on in this process. But you'll like if if we actually look at what's inside this surprise object, it this right now does not contain any of the samples. And that's because when we actually bring in the samples, it adds a whole lot more data to the object. And uh and, and it potentially slows down the whole workflow. So let me just go back here. So you can see here in this get site tab uh, in the simple workflow that we can actually search by a lot of different things. So we can 
combine all of these as well. So I could say that, oops. so I could say I want to search by surprise and I want the database to be uh, the North American pollen, uh, the North American pollen database. And now if I look at surprise, ah, can't type in, you'll see I only have one record now. And that's because it's only this surprise lake with the pollen data set that is in the North American pollen database. These other ones, this surprise cave is part of Fawn Map. Uh, I suspect that these diatom and water chemistry ones are part of the Drexel University um, diatom database. So we can start very early on limiting the kinds of data that we're looking for. Um, ah, sorry, I. Uh, if I want more help on using these, I can always, for those of you that aren't familiar with R, I can always type a question mark and then the function name, and it will give me the help. And you can see here, it tells you all the different kinds of uh, terms that I want to search for. I could... Uh, if I'm looking for all locations in the world, let's say, uh, that contain Liliaceae pollen, I could do that. Maybe I shouldn't have called it surprise. Um, but one of the things here, again, that you'll note is that this only gives me 25 records. And so this is another thing that we do with the database and that you may run into from time to time. Um, it, these, these objects are big and it can take a lot of time both to process it on the database and to serve it out through the, uh, through the web. And so what we've generally done is we've limited searches by default to only 25 records at a time. That is just to save you from accidentally saying, I'm going to pull every single site in Neotoma and then sitting there for an hour while it downloads. So by default, we only return 25 records and you can fix that by saying limit is equal to, let's say 50 or 500 or 5,000 or we have a flag that I think is explained here. Oh, do we not say it in this? I guess not in the help. No. Oh, we do We do show the flag here. But there is a flag that is all data and we'll fix that. <laughs> so all data will say now, give me every single record that has Liliaceae in the atom. And so you can see this takes a lot longer. And that's because it's process, it's it's searching through the database, it's linking all the taxa names that contain Liliaceae, and then it is returning the site. And I can show you this now. So I can just say length. Uh, I'm just I'm using this surprise. Well, you can see here that that's 1,500 sites. I can also type length. But you can see how big this is. So this went out and returned 35 megabytes to your computer. So, I mean, it's it's not huge, but I think it might be bigger than some people expect. <laughs> and so, anyway, there's the length. We get uh, we have 1,500 sites in uh, in Neotoma that contain Liliaceae pollen, and I can plot leaflet. And I'm going to now plot it on this map. And you can see, here's the distributions of these sites. And so there's, here's Kenya. And here's our records from Kenya that have Liliaceae pollen. 
And so this is all, uh, these African ones uh, are, this is all stuff that's been uploaded recently by uh, stewards for the African pollen database. And I think those of you who have been familiar with uh, Neotoma for a long time will know this is pretty exciting that we that we're really starting to populate uh, data from Africa. It's awesome, and so yay. Okay, so uh, are do we have questions right now about doing a site search? I have a quick question. So yeah. To uh, clarify, when you search for sites, it actually downloads to your computer, or like, yeah. is it something that you have to clear after? Um, like viewing it, say you searched and then you don't want it after all, do you have to then delete it? You, you don't have to. I mean, it, it depends on how big the objects are. Um, but basically what we do with these objects is the, and the idea with these workflows is that you build up the object that you're working with. So you start out with the site search and it gives you these, so like, but let's take a look at this. Um, just a second, let me annotate this. Okay, so when you do the initial site search with get sites, what it does is it just, ah, there we go. It, it basically populates this part of this diagram. So you get, uh, and you saw that, whoop, you saw that we get, like the site, when I did the, uh, when I just typed the name, surprise, uh, you get the site ID, you get the site name, you get information about the altitude and, and any sort of notes. There's another function that we use after this that is get data sets. And what that does is it then gives you information about the collection units and fills in this information about the actual data sets, so the, the data that's in there. So it'll give you more, it'll give you the DOI of the record, it'll give you information about the age range that those samples cover, it will give you information uh, about the PIs who, who did the analysis, and then that so, so it's sort of filling in this information. It'll also give you uh, information about the chronologies associated with the record. And then we do another call that is get downloads and we'll see that further on. And that's when we actually pull in all of the samples with the actual raw pollen counts. So the idea, clear all drawings. So the idea is that we start out with this like surprise object uh, with the sites, and then we will filter through and just say, I only want sites that are pollen data sets that are in like South America. And then we will get that, that, that cover this age range. And then we will get all the data for that and get the downloads and then start plotting things. Mm -hmm. So again, you can see that, you know, these, these objects are big. And so we want to really help people filter down to the data that they really want and then start manipulating it. And you'll see that throughout in this workflow as well. So, so these objects are just like stored in local memory. So you can yep. work with them in the meantime um, and then eventually maybe export them as a file or something yeah exactly yes yeah and so and we actually do that in this code and you'll see that in a little bit okay thank you so the other thing you can do that we've uh that we've added recently is you can use spatial objects as well so um so a lot of people so uh, so if you are trying to download data within certain watersheds, within state or national boundaries, within uh, parks, um, whatever, uh, oftentimes people are using uh, GIS or, or shape files more often in their workflows. And so what we support as well is the use of spatial polygons. Hang on, my dog needs to get out. 
is supporting the use of spatial objects in this package as well. Um, and, okay. Oh, I thought I had the link to that. Oh yeah, okay. So what you see here, so here is the search that we did with just the name. This next section, which is also in the uh, RMD file, what I'm doing here is I'm I'm creating an object in R called GeoJSON. And this uses a data format called GeoJSON that defines a polygon in this case with a set of coordinates in longitude, latitude that uh, define some sort of boundary. Um, so you don't have to worry particularly about learning how to write this there are tools online and i'll we'll go to the links in a second that that help you do that or in r you can create these objects the point is that i turn them into a spatial object and i can do this search so if you want to you can copy this code and paste it into our uh our instance of our studio in the browser, or if you scroll down in that simple workflow document, we are at uh, line 109 in the document. You'll see the, the line numbers here. I can select this and hit control enter. There we go. And you can see, I now have an object called GeoJSON, I can type that and it's just this plain text. I use an R package called GeoJSON SF to turn it into a spatial object and I can plot BCSF if I want and that's what it looks like. <laughs> it's not really anything special. You can't tell what's underneath it but these are sets of coordinate points. And then I can call get sites and this is going to go out to neotoma again it's just running right now and i can see bc sites i use this all data is equal to true so i'm pulling in all of the sites in this domain i get 1140 elements and I can again plot leaflet BC sites. And you can see that here are all the sites in this domain. So my bounding box, um, my bounding box sort of covers this region. Um, Here's the here's the example that actually renders here. So what I did in this code was I plotted it and then I added the polygon. So one of the reasons we use this leaflet package is because it does help us build these interactive maps that lets us zoom in and stuff like that. And it also lets us do some other fancier stuff. The main point is, this is not really like, this isn't so much for analytical work. This is just to help us visualize the data, see what kind of sites we get, and, and take a look at it a little more closely. And so again, I can go to the Explorer link if I want to find out more about certain points. I can zoom in and zoom out. I can see, I can go out to the UCFV and see some of these sites. Have people been able to get that to work? Looks like yes. Okay. 
So what I'd like you to do is if you go to this document, this simple workflow document, you will see under this locations equals loc header, there are two links, this WKT link and this GeoJSON link. If you click this, I'm going to open it in a new tab just so that I don't accidentally uh, overwrite this. This is a tool that lets me create GeoJSON. And so I can draw a polygon wherever I want. And so here, let's uh, let's zoom in and draw a polygon oh, over Kenya. What am I doing here? There we go. Okay, so I'm going to select this pentagon. And I'm just going to do this. So I'm clicking the points down. And then I'm double clicking at the end to create it. So I am just going to select this code. I'm going to copy it. And I'm going to go into R, and I'm going to say uh, Kenya is equal to, I have to put it in brackets, or in quotes, sorry. And I'm just going to copy and paste that. Oh, oh, shoot. A second, let me try that again. Kenya is equal to, I have to use single quotes because uh, this GeoJSON uses double quotes. So I've done that, and then I'm going to use this command. So here, let me actually do it here. So I'm just going to replace this GeoJSON with the one that I pulled in from that uh, GeoJSON.io. So I've run that, and now I'm gonna, I'm not gonna change the variable names, I'm just gonna do that. And then do this. And what we'll see is it's now run and the number of elements has changed and I can basically plot this exact same thing again. And so I've replaced the location My, what happened there? Why did that change? Hey, Simon, um, there's a question from Ross, um, but also didn't you add that data in when you first pasted it in from the, the new JSON when you first brought that in? In green, you know, what didn't that load it up or did you have to, because you seems like you're doing it again. Yeah, I am because I've changed the uh, polygon. Hang on. Why is this not? Well, what's going on? Why isn't it plotting though? Yeah, that's weird. Cause... There we go. Oh. I didn't know what was going on. Okay. Uh, okay. So I just I copied and pasted this new polygon in. Uh, and sorry, let's check the chat here. It's. Is it possible to use a multi-polygon bounding box? Yes. 
Yeah, it is. Can I just, um, in my workflow, Simon, I was, I drew a bounding box around British Columbia using GeoJSON. And obviously yep. there's quite a few sites that are right on the boundary. Yeah. So I ended up having a bunch of sites that weren't within the province. So I ended up filtering those individually, uh, which is fine, but it just wasn't a super efficient way to do that. But I know that from the BC data catalog, there's a BC bounding box multi-polygon. I tried to convert that into a spatial object and then use that to pull get sites and it didn't work for some reason. Like yeah. why? So I so that is something that we've uh fixed pretty recently. So there is an issue. Um so so it has to do with <laughs> it's it's complicated, <laughs> basically is the answer. Um so the way that we convert spatial objects to be able to interact with the database itself doesn't support feature collections. Um, and so my guess is that if you are if you're pulling something in from a shape file, uh, we have had we've fixed that just very recently. Um, and so so it might be that uh, with the very newest version of the package, uh, it it will work. But with the current one um, in our studio right now, it will not work. It, it should uh, work, I think. It, it should work, but uh, there may be issues. If you are still running into issues, could you like send us a link to the data object, and um, and we can we can test it out and see why it's not working. Yeah, for sure. And I know that there, I was getting some messaging from the BC data catalog saying that their stuff's a bit out of date as well. So we'll, yeah. I'll try it again though. I mean, the, the other thing I will say, and I think uh, I, I hope people will agree with me in general is that I, I generally find uh, that bounding boxes based explicitly on the political boundaries are not super great to use um, just because ecosystems don't stop at the 49th parallel for example and so sometimes uh the these like these big multi-polygon things aren't actually as useful as just drawing that really rough bounding box so um but yeah there's there's lots of reasons for doing that so okay uh, what I would like to do right now is ask you all to take a minute and go to this geojson.io uh, map. I'll paste the link into the chat. Um, I think that that'll just zoom in on sort of BC, but you can scroll around and make your own bounding box. And so to do that again, we're gonna click this polygon map and I'm going to, uh, this polygon, and I'm gonna click, 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 and then double click when I'm done. It's gonna change this text on the side. I'm gonna copy it. Oh, sorry, first I'm gonna clear everything. And then I'm gonna do it. What is going on? I'm going to copy one of them. Where do I clear the feature? There we go. Uh, 
and I'm going to paste it in here. So I'm just going to replace this GeoJSON. So take a second, uh, see if you can do it. And then you can either, in this chunk starting at line 109, once you've replaced that GeoJSON text, you can either click this little play button here to run the current chunk. Or you can select it all and run it by hitting control enter, or you can copy and paste it. And just try that out and let me know how it's going. If you're having problems, let me know. I'll paste uh, in here. This is the. I'll paste in the chat the GeoJSON that I have for uh, the polygon I made around Kenya. And so you can copy paste that if you want. But we're just going into this code and replacing the text that was in that GeoJSON. And then doing that spatial search using all data is equal to true. Have people been able to get that to work? Yes, no. I had a problem, Simon. Yeah. Um, I blew a fuse a minute ago, so I was kicked out for a little bit, and <laughs> I missed the GeoJSON thing. And um, so I managed to make uh, a polygon. Yep. And how do I save that then as a GeoJSON? Uh, sorry, did you make the geo? You made the polygon on this GeoJSON map. I made the polygon on this map, GeoJSON map. Yes. Okay, so yeah, so on the right hand side, you should just see this, like JSON. Yeah. So just copy that, uh, like uh, either select it all, uh, or there it has this button, this copy button. But you just select it all, uh, so you can Control A uh in there yep uh and then you paste it into the r markdown code here at line 110 so you replace the geojson that was there with your new one and then you'll and then you'll run this block of code by you can just hit that play button And so once that's done, you will have an object that is this geo, this spatial object, and you will have the sites, and you can scroll down and run this chunk, and that will map it for you. But for whatever reason, it is not locking here what is the problem my oh oh ah shoot it's because it's plotting down here oh yeah yeah right so there it is so you can see there Is that working for you now? Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. 
So again, we have this interactive map that's now part of our thing. So um, have people been able to, uh, so if, if you're having issues uh, searching right now, um, why don't you message in the chat? Uh, the easiest thing for us is if you copy and paste the code and the error message that you're getting, um, that would be super helpful. And I'm just gonna move on a little bit here. Okay. Oh. Okay. So we, uh, depending on where we're searching and whatever, we may have more sites than we want. Uh, so I'm going to go back up here. I'm just going to hit Control Z a couple times to undo my changes so that I'm back with this BC polygon. Um, if you want to follow along, I will paste the original code in there. Uh, it's also one of the nice things about having the website and the R markdown is you can just copy and paste it from here as well. So I'm just returning back to the, the BC data examples. So I'm going to run this. That's all going to output. And then I'm going to run this as well. So it's going to download all my sites. Now, uh, but, but, but. so like I said before, sometimes we get more data than we actually want. And so what we want to do is we want to take a look at what kinds of data we're actually getting in our data sets. And so I am just running this summary function. This, honestly, our studio, our studio does things that I don't like. Okay, so I'm going to run this summary function, and basically it is going to give me a list of all the different data sets that I get. You can see there's a bunch of pollen surface sample records, there's a bunch of pollen records, geochronologic, uh, and I'm omitting a whole bunch of rows. But you can see that there's a bunch of different data set types in here. Uh, there is another helper function called get IDs, which as you start doing more work with the R package, uh, I find really helpful. And all it does is, uh, is it just returns the unique identifier numbers for all the sites, the collection units, and data sets. So for in Neotoma, every site Every collection unit, every data set, every contact, they all have unique identifiers. And they're really helpful for just like matching things up as we go forward working through things. So I just wanted to, to show you those two uh, things. Uh, there is also a function called coordinates. And that just pulls out all the unique coordinates for the sites if you want to do some other kinds of plotting. Okay. So there are these helper functions. And if you actually look, one of the reasons we have this image here is if you look here, you can see all the different functions. So we have a sites object and there's a bunch of different functions that you can use on it. Uh, all the way through here, you can see. And so you can go to the help. If you want to know how to use one of these functions, you just write question mark and then the name of the function and it will tell you what to do. So we have our sites. Now we want to add in the metadata about the different data set types or about the individual data sets. So what we're going to do now is I'm just going to create a new object. Uh, but I'm going to go back to this document. And I'm going to get the data sets now. And so you can see our BC sites is an object of uh, 37 megabytes. I'm actually going to delete. Uh, that's fine. I'm not. Uh, 
So this is in memory right now. I'm now going to run BC data sets. You can see it ran. It's going to go to every single one of those sites and add the data set elements to the object. So before we basically just had uh, up. Okay, so before the information that we pulled in really just had this site information. There was some minimum collection unit information. So there was information about collection unit handles and there was information about uh, data set types, uh, but there, there was pretty minimal information there. Now what we've done is we've added that information. Just a second, let me just clear that. We've added that information using this get data sets call. And again, we're trying to pull in, in this case, 1,100 data sets. And so you can see it's actually taking uh, some time. Hang on. The animals have decided to join me. So this is, again, one of the issues with using this all data is equal to true. And you'll see a little bit further down that we start working on using this filtering. So one of the nice things about, I'm going to just, uh, the, do I want to keep doing this? So this, this may happen to you. Um, one of the nice things about uh, the way that R works is that you can always save objects. And we actually do that a bit later on. There is a code example here where we read in a data object. So we can, uh, so you'll see that we read all the data sets. We're gonna filter to say we want only data sets where the data set type is pollen and there it has a defined like uh, age ranges. Um, later on, what we actually did was we saved that object using a function called uh, save RDS. And so if we look in the files in this data folder, you'll see that there is this BC download object and that is a saved R object. So if we're working with really big objects uh, in our as part of our workflows, uh, particularly with the Neotoma package, uh, it's often helpful to, after a step where you say download a whole bunch of data, like here, we might want to say, um, like save RDS BC, uh, BC data sets. Uh, so, so do something like this. And what that would let us do is the next time we run this, instead of having to actually like run this line, we can just load that object back in using read RDS. Uh, sorry, I think we say BC data sets, right? So, so we can just do this uh, the next time we run this. And that's because sometimes these things do take a really long time. Does that make sense? For folks while we're while I'm killing time. <laughs> okay. Uh did I make a mistake? No, probably some data sets have been removed, so going to be my guess. No, that looks right. Okay. okay. Great. Okay, so uh, this is, oh yeah, because things get combined, yeah. right. Okay, 
So we now have uh, 909 elements. Uh, it is a biggish object. Again, I'm not going to save it. But again, there are these helper functions like this data sets function. And so I can uh, put that there and I will get summary information about all the different data sets. And so uh, just a second. Let's just look at the first one. Uh, so you can see, so this is a lot of rows, but you can see now with this data sets function, I get the data set ID. It tells me the database, the data set type and, and all that. And then some notes as well, if there are notes. And so these notes can often be really important for us. Uh, when we're looking at uh, looking at stuff, um, I could also do this. Uh, so here, I'm just going to do a table of the different data set types. So I'm just taking the summary information about the data sets. I'm taking the column data set type, and I'm putting it into a table. And so this is going to tell me what kinds of data set types I'm getting out of this uh, polygon that I did, and that did not work. You need to do a data frame. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I was just about to do that. All right. Um, okay, so you can see that when I do that for this big area, I'm getting 95 pollen records, I'm getting 235 pollen surface samples, 377 water chemistry records, um, some diatom samples, diatom surface samples, diatom bottom samples, uh, all these kinds of things. Now, for this workflow uh, that we're gonna keep working on, really, I am just gonna, I wanna focus just on the pollen records. And so we have these filter functions. And so here I'm going to take my BC data sets and I'm going to use this pipe function. So this is basically saying start out with BC data sets and then apply this function to it. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say I want only things that have data set type pollen and I want only things that uh, have a defined younger age range. So all data sets have a, uh, an age range. I don't know if we can see that here. That, that comes from the, um, that comes from the chronologies that are associated with it. So I'm going to just run this. And it's going to go through all those sites and all those data sets. It's basically removing any data set that is not, that is a water chemistry data set or a testing amoeba surface sample data set or whatever. Um, oh. And uh, so you'll see now that BC data sets had 909 elements in it, 909 sites. BC records only had 68 sites. So we've gotten rid of a large number of those records. And I can plot leaflet BC records. And you can see now, oh, we still are covering that same spatial range, but there are fewer samples in here. If I wanted just the, uh, if I wanted just uh, let's say the, just the vertebrate fauna, I could do the same thing by right? basically just changing that data set type. And we can filter on all sorts of the same kinds of things that we can do the get site search with and the get data set search with. Um, so I could I could do this by site name. 
uh, I don't. Uh, that should work. Oh, I think I mistyped the name. But but basically, you can do these kinds of searches. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm just going to do this. I'm going to go back and do this with pollen again. If you want to see how uh, what you can do with the filter, let me just wait. We can do. We can go to the help, and it shows you what you can search by. So we could say like, I want, uh, uh, so we can search by site name or filter by site name, latitude, longitude, altitude, uh, the database, the age ranges, um, all sorts of stuff. So I could actually say like, maybe I'm only interested in high altitude sites. Uh, I could say altitude, is greater than like that would be 500 meters. So I've reduced, I, I know I'm calling this BC and it includes some sites in Oregon. Um, oh, Just a second. <laughs> My. My robot vacuum cleaner just started as well. <laughs> There we go. All right. Uh, so now I'm just going to copy and paste this down here. And you can see, oh, because I didn't run that again. Anyway, so so now we'll just have the sites, uh, the pollen sites from BC. What's wrong? It is, uh, for various reasons, I don't use our studio um, anymore. <laughs> I, I use VS Code, uh, but why is that not? Oh, that's why. There we go. Sorry. So I had a site name there, and so it was just it was going to just give me only sites that had uh, pollen, that had site name pollen. Okay, so here we go. Here's all the different pollen records. Um, you can see like there's Moraine Bog, whatever, all these different um, locations. There's Marion Lake, Battleground Lake, da da da. And so we can do more filtering if we wanted to. We could we could get more information if we wanted to. Uh, but for now, we're going to leave it. So now what I want to actually do is I want to pull in all of the samples. So to do that, what we would normally do if we were just doing this from beginning to end is we would use this function uh, you can see here. Uh, we would use this function get downloads. And so get downloads goes to those sites and it pulls in all the additional metadata that we need. Um, but that takes a long time because it's pulling in quite a bit of data. And so in this workflow, you can see I'm just going to read that file that I had previously saved. And you'll see now we have this BCDL object. Um, that, that has all that additional information in it. So when we go to uh, this, this image here, what we now have is we have an object with sites. Those sites all have collection units. They all have data sets and that data set information now contains all of this plus all of the sample information. And so the samples are where the pollen counts are. And we can look at them using this samples function. 
So I'm just going to run that and hopefully you can run that as well. <clears throat> and you can see here that there are 84,000 observations of 37 variables. So this is every single pollen count at every single depth in all of those 68 sites. And if I look at all SAMP, if I'm just going to type the first row, so this is it's it's a two dimensional matrix with columns and rows, and so I'm just saying give me the first row. You can see that there's a whole lot of information. So there is an age column. There's a column for the age type, so that we know whether the chronology was done using calibrated radiocarbon years, radiocarbon years, whatever it is. We have age ranges, so this is showing us that there is uncertainty in this data model. There's an age older and age younger column. There is an identifier for the kind, the, the actual chronology that was used for that site. There was a, there's a chronology name. Um, there are the units that the sample, uh, the units for the sample. So in this case, this is the volume measurement uh, and the value. Uh, this is a laboratory analysis element. Um, it has, this is the sample quantity. Uh, it tells you who did this analysis, uh, the depth of that sample, the thickness of that sample, the database that sample comes from, the data set type, all these, like a, a whole bunch of different information. And then, like, then a, bu a bunch of data here. This age range old and age range young, don't get caught up by this. Uh, it is different than age old and age younger. This is for the entire data set. This is the, the range of ages in that data set. So there's a lot of information in these in this sample table and part of the reason for that um is that we are really trying to work with people uh we we're, we want to make this work for multiple data set types and so for people who are working with um for people who are working with things like fauna some of this context information and symmetry information is really important because they need to know, like, is it the right metatarsal or the left metatarsal or, or whatever it is. Um, we can look at the variable names. Those are effectively the taxon names. They're associated with taxon IDs. Uh, and so we can pull out the, the different kinds of uh, data that are in there. Um, so if we want to look at the taxa that are actually in these records, are, is everyone okay right now? Does this make sense? Was everyone able to get those samples? Looks like yes. Okay. So we can actually look at all the different taxa or, or sort of meta taxa that are in these records. So neotoma... Uh, Neotoma has a fairly liberal view of what constitutes a taxon. Um, sorry. Uh, because, because of the way the database is structured, things like sample volume are considered, uh, are in the taxony, uh, taxonomy table, um, but they are given a taxon group of labo or laboratory analyses. So we can actually, for all of these records that we've pulled for BC from the BC, from the pollen database type, we can generate a table of the unique taxa by using this taxa function. And so if I look at this, I can see here, here's all my taxa. I have, uh, I have sample, I have some sample quantities. I have, you can look at the variable names. I've got 
uh, these other laboratory analyses. So these are like podium spikes, those kinds of things. Um, and if I do that, oh, it's giving me just as many. Um, and so this is giving me all of the different names. And uh, we can, where is BCTX? There we go. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Here we go. So I just clicked on that to view it. And I can now sort of just scroll through and you can see all these different variable names that we we go from the ones that are like laboratory analyses. Uh, we have these, uh, boop, there, I just sorted it. So we have in, in along with these pollen counts, people were also reporting their counts of pediastrum or uh, Botryococcus. Uh, Typha latifolia, Lemna, Ponemagedon, uh, um, Nufar, all these kinds of things. And so you can, so there's the aquatics. Uh, here, this is TRSH, is tree shrub. You can see these element types of pollen. You can see that there's uh, people, some people were analyzing their pine pollen. Uh, they were just calling it pinus undiff, or they were differentiating it into the haplozylon and diplozylon. And so we can do all sorts of stuff with this now if we want to. Um, the other thing that this taxon table does is it gives us the number of samples that these things were found in and the number of sites that these were found in. So again, I'm going to just sort here by, uh, oh, I'll sort the other way. So Poaceae was found in 68 sites. And so if you remember, if you look at our object, we only had 68 sites. So Poaceae is in every single one of them. Artemisia in 67 of them. Um, lots of them have Suda, uh, Suga heterophylla. So we go from sort of the most common taxa, we can in this case scroll down to uh, less and less common things. And you can also see that even though some of these were only counted in one site, whoever was doing the counting, you know, counted lots of dinoflagellates in their sample. So these are really helpful uh, in some senses, this, this taxon table, because it gives you a sense of the frequency of the different taxa, but it also gives you a sense of whether or not um, you need to, for your analysis, combine things together. So we know that there was, uh, where was the pinus undiff? So we can see that pinus undiff is counted at 30 sites. It's lot in lots of samples at those 30 sites. There's also a pinus that was counted at 27 sites. And so probably we would want to at some point combine pinus and pinus on diff for our analysis because effectively they are the same thing. And I think if we scroll down, here's this pinus subgenus strobus, depending on the kinds of analysis we want to do, we might want to actually start combining some of these taxa. So in our simple workflow, I go through a section where we talk about taxonomic harmonization. And so let's assume that for this, uh, let's assume that for this analysis, I actually want to combine all of the different pinus into one single group that is called just pinus. So I'm going to assume that pinus on diff, pinus subgenerus strobus, Pinus, uh, the the different subgenera, and then just pinus. I want to I want to lump those all in together. We can use these uh, these tidyverse dplyr kinds of functions. Um, here's the code here where I take this whole long sample table. I'm just going to walk you through what what I'm doing, and then we'll try it. So. 
we know that there were a bunch of different ecological groups in that table. If we look here again, uh, where's my view? If we look here at these ecological groups, there's the aquatics, there's algae, there's the laboratory ones, uh, there is this one palm tree <laughs> pollen uh, at a site in one sample at one site. So for my analysis, let's just say all I'm interested in is pollen, and I'm only interested in the pollen of trees and shrubs because I'm doing sort of very broad scale analysis. So I'm taking all samples. I am going to filter so that I'm only selecting the samples that have tree and shrub pollen. And then I am going to the column variable name in my table. I am trying to see if it starts with Pinus and then has, this is a flag to sort of say like anything, there can be anything after it. So I'm just detecting whether or not there is Pinus in it. And I'm changing all of those fields that have that to be Pinus undiff. So these pipes are basically saying, take the thing that is before the pipe, these sort of percent arrows, and apply this function to it. And then take this bit and apply this function to it. So if I go to my RStudio now and open up this simple workflow, I'm going to all samp and I'm going to run this. So if we look at all samp uh, variable name, I'm just going to do uh, unique here. So I'm just going to look at the unique variable name. So you remember when we first looked at that list of taxon names, there was a whole lot of them. Now you can see that, I mean, there's still a lot. There's not as many. There's only 151. These are, uh, for those of you that recognize these things, these are all only pollen types. Uh, and actually, let me just, I'm just going to sort this alphabetically. So I'm going to use sort here. And if I scroll up, what we should see is that we still have these Pinaceae ones, but we don't have all of the different Pinus ones. So everything in that Pinus group has been switched to Pinus undiff. And we could do this same thing for, let's say, Populus maybe is, is one that we want to lump together. Um, and or maybe we want to do it for like the different Shepardia taxa, whatever it is. So we we can take this really simple approach, sort of on a uh, like a variable by variable, like a, a taxon by taxon approach. Or uh, and so this is what sort of would look like. So so we could do the same thing with Picea or Nufar, or Alder. Uh, I don't know why I wrote Alder there. It should be Allness. Um, but but we, can, we can do that same sort of thing. The other approach we can take is to do it more systematically. And I've done that here uh, further down. I'm not going to go into it in too much detail. But basically, you can take that taxon, that taxon table and write it out to a file and then add a new column uh, whoop, and add a new column where you have the original variable name and then the replacement variable name. And so maybe we want to like, maybe I'm willing to accept that any polygon ACA that I find is just, I'm just gonna call it pol uh, poly polygon <laughs> polygonum. Um, and so I could just have two columns with a, and then maybe some of these ones that we don't find very often, I'm just gonna let them get lumped into other. And so this is a 
workflow here that you can use. We're not going to go through it, but you can copy and paste this in. Basically, you write out the file, you edit that file using Excel or whatever it is you want to edit so that you have this new table. Uh, let me, I'm just going to show you that. So I had the original my taxon table, which just looked like, which, which was the taxon table. It had all these columns, units, context, element, blah, blah, blah. Oh, let me, and then this one, I just, so all I did was I took only the variable name column and I added a new column called replacement where I went through and I just said, okay, anything that's called ABs still going to be called ABs. I'm going to uh, ABs Lazia Carpa. I'm going to just call it ABs, ABs on diff, blah, blah, uh, whatever. And so you can see here, I, I made some judgments. This was, um, you know, this was sort of off, off by the seat of my pants. Um, and I didn't do it for a bunch of them. <laughs> But you can see, basically, I just tried to simplify these uh, taxonomies. Um, yeah, and then I gave up. I got bored. Uh, and so this is something that you can do, uh, and especially if you are, uh, if you're an expert in, in a regional taxonomy, you can do this, uh, and you can share those files. And there's a pretty straightforward way in this code. So I'm going to take, uh, whoop. I'm going to go here. There's my right. Where is my read? Okay, here. So I am going to read this. You all have this file, and so you can read that. And then we can apply that change. So I've got my samples. I'm going to just run that again. And then what I am doing here is a little bit complicated. And so I'm going to walk you through this. So I now have a, a variable called translation. It is that species table. It's got two columns, one column called variable name and one column called replacement. I am taking it and linking it to the all samples table. All samples also has a column called variable name. And so I am joining those two tables together. All samples, I am passing into this function. I am joining it with the variable called translation. And I am saying these two columns should line up. So basically what I'm doing is I'm adding this column called replacement to the original table of samples. And then I am selecting all the columns except variable name. So basically what I'm doing is I'm replacing the original taxonomy name with the replacement taxonomy name. And then I am grouping them, grouping these rows together using all the columns. And so what this means is that there are cases in a sample where I might have, uh, so I might have in one sample, Pinus undiff, Pinus subgenera stroba, Pinus subgenera contorta, or whatever it is. And so I want to group all those together using the new replacement name. And the value I'm going to use is the sum of those values. Does that make sense? So that then where we might have originally had three separate Pinus in our sample, I'm now calling them all Pinus, which is the, the taxonomic harmonization that I'm doing. And the value for that instance is going to be the sum of all of those three original records. Are, are we following? Yeah. 
Yeah, you're you're basically uh, uh, simplifying the data set and and clustering these things to not have so many variables um, and lump the ones together uh, that would naturally go together. Yeah, exactly. At some <laughs> level of taxonomic resolution that works. Yeah, and so I think as I am talking through, so so part of the thing about the Neotoma R package is there's lots that we can do to support people. Um, but there's also a whole lot of different things that people need done. And so part of the reason we're providing these workflows and worksheets is so that these can act um, so that these can act as sort of cookbooks for you later on. So I understand that this code is not super straightforward. Um, but part of what we want to do is provide it for you here so that you can sort of copy and paste it, basically. You can use this, um, you can use this later on. Uh, we ran this with a lab group in sort of a more detailed way, and one of the recommendations was to have more comments, um, and I recognize that, and we will do that in the future. Hopefully also having this recording will help. Um, and obviously if you have questions, uh, please let us know. So part of, part of the issue is that this data is complicated and the things that we do as paleoecologists are often pretty complicated too. And so it's it's we're really trying to find this balance between simplifying things and then also letting people do custom code. So I apologize if this is maybe not as straightforward as as it could be. I think Simon, for me, for me personally, if I can uh, just say, I think it's great. This is brilliant. Um, I really appreciate the the, the workflow um, examples and the code, and you know, it seems to be following pretty 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 great. And um, also, Slack is easy to join um, to get information that way. So I, I think it's awesome, and it's really helpful to the students what you're doing here because in in many cases, I've asked them to simplify their thesis to not try to incorporate everything that's available because it's a lot and too much for their project but maybe if they wanted you know in some cases they may be interested in in the trees only yeah and so being able to go through and 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 narrow down the data sets that are uploaded and just have the tree data for example would be super helpful uh, yeah. to that. that's great i'm i'm glad <laughs> So, so yeah, so I mean, this, this all samples gives you that opportunity, right? And so you can do, you can, you can select individual taxa if you want, um, using that filter function. Uh, and so here, anyway, we're, we're doing this grouping. Uh, so let's do that. And now if I look at all samp, uh, but that's actually not going to help. But if I view this, so you can see originally when we did it, it was like 85,000 rows. We've now reduced it because uh, we are only keeping the trees and shrubs. Uh, we're doing a few other things. And so now we're at like 15,000. Um, so right, it's still a lot, but that's because th this is all of the core data from all 68 records in this spatial domain, right? So this is uh, every single taxon at every single sample, at every single site. Um, I am going to, uh, no, okay, let's, let's do this as well. So we, we've sort of done some, uh, we've done a look, sorry, those, that table doesn't really pull out very nicely, okay. So we can go to the stratigraphic plotting. So we've done a look at like what happens at broad scales. We can also do things at uh, at single at the single site level. So this BCDL object uh, that we've created is a is a set of pollen sites or a set of core sites or a set of sample sites. We can subsample them using this format. This is maybe familiar to people who have worked with lists in R before. 
Uh, basically, we're just saying take the first object. And so I can uh, go here and I can say BCDL. Again, it will give me a list of all of the sites. And so maybe I'm interested in, uh, maybe I'm not interested in the first one, maybe I'm interested in the third one. So Row Lake is a site from Southern Vancouver Island. Um, and so I can say BCDL3, and it will give me just, uh, this is this is sort of just a very simple summary of that, but um, I could say like data set. Oh, there we go. And, and you can see that this Row Lake site has a single pollen data set associated with it, at least in our object. There may be more, but um, in our object, there is only one. So I can select a single site. And so let's, oh, sorry, I keep forgetting. So let's, uh, I'm gonna replace this with three for whatever reason, just to show you that we can. So now I've, I've created a new variable that is just that third site, that is just row lake. I wanna get the taxa for it. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm getting ready to make a stratigraphic pollen diagram. And so I'm going to, I just want to make a list of taxa that I'm going to plot in a stratigraphic diagram. So I don't want to plot every single taxon because I feel like that's crazy. So uh, what I want to do is I want to take all of the taxa. I want to just get the trees and shrubs. I want to just get the trees and shrubs in, in this set of taxa that are recorded as pollen. I want to arrange them by the number of samples they appear in. So this is sort of giving me like an assessment of how frequent they are in the record. And then I just want to take the top 10. So if I do this, what I'll get is I will get the taxa that appear most commonly. And so these are the top 10 at that site. If I just did it this way, so I'm gonna just drop that head, that, that last command, it's gonna look basically the same, but there's gonna be more rows. So here you can see there's 16 more rows. Uh, where's plotting taxa? So I'm just going to view this. Oh, there we go. So you can see here, there's this samples column. So Alnus viridis appears in all 114 samples at this site. And then as I go down, they appear less and less frequency, frequently. And so in my stratigraphic diagram, I don't, I mean, I don't really care about plotting the change over time of something that appears only once. So in this case, I'm choosing the top 10. You can make a choice. You don't have to do it the way I'm doing it. Um, the thing here is just that there's lots of ways of doing it. All I'm doing is just trying to get these names so that we can then go in and turn this samples table. So if you remember that samples table is really long, what we're going to do here is we are going to turn it into a wide table. So I'm going to take plotting site. I'm going to get all the samples. And then we have a function in this R package called too wide, which lets us group things by, so I'm going to say I want everything that is in the tree shrub ecological group. I want everything that is measured using NISP. So that's the number, this is like the count, the number of individual specimens. I want only things that are pollen. And then I'm going to group them by age. So each row is going to be all pollen taxa in the columns. This is why it's called wide. So all of the pollen taxa by age. So each row is going to be effectively 
uh, each individual age in the database. And then I'm going to use proportion. So I'm going to sum across the rows. And so again, uh, these functions, you can go in to too wide and it will explain how to do it and what each, what these all mean. But if I, so if I look at uh, samples uh, plotting site, you remember what our samples looked like initially. It's got so much information a bit like the, the site notes. It's got the latitude, longitudes, the site name, the age ranges, all this kind of stuff. We don't need all that if we are plotting a stratigraphic diagram. All I want are the pollen types grouped by age, and I want proportions. And so I can look at counts, and you can see here now that I've got age as a column, and then I've got all the different taxa, which is great. And so each taxon is in its own column. And so I can look here and I can see, okay, here's like the, I mean, I can just see this looking at my screen. Here's the change in ABs over time. Here's the change in Acer macrophyllum, that big leaf maple over time, Arbutus over time, whatever. Uh, now I guess I, oh, I guess I didn't change that. Oops. Um, okay. There's a lot of other packages in R for paleoecologists. Um, so Rioja was written by Steve Juggins, and it does all sorts of things like constrained clustering. It has this stratigraphic plotting. The analog package written by Gavin Simpson has many of the similar things as well. Um, this is just an example using stratplot, but I can add the constrained clustering. And then I need to change this to pollen percent. So I actually didn't, uh, I lied when I said I was. Oh, sorry, my plots up down there. OK. There we go. So this actually plotted everything. It uses uh, weighted averaging uh, scaling to, to choose the most important ones. But regardless, we you can simplify it yourself or you can use the built-in uh, tools. But here we have now gone from this setup where you know we have all these sites, we have the samples to something where we can actually plot uh, a stratigraphic diagram. And so the Neotoma 2 package is not intended to replace these other packages like Rioja or Analog. It's just a way to get the data to them directly from Neotoma in sort of a more efficient way. Um, so here's our stratigraphic diagram. We can see maybe like we call this pollen zone one, pollen zone two, pollen zone three, whatever it is. We have our ages down the side. We have our changes in the different taxa. And we could, if we wanted to, uh, so if we wanted to do that kind of grouping, we would do that up in this step where we, we saw how to do the taxonomic harmonization. We did it on the result of that samples object. Um, and so we could add some of that taxonomic harmonization in this spot here, and then go to the wide table. Okay. This is a lot where we're like running through a lot. My hope is that, you know, we have, um, my hope is that we have this document. You have, again, you have the Slack channel um, and you can always access the R Studio from the web. Uh, so my hope is that I know we're going fast, but 
um, I, I want to cover the things we can do so that then you can go back and uh, and check them out again. So uh, the next thing we're going to do is uh, is this, which I think is is kind of cool. What we want to do now is we want to say, okay, across all sites, so across this regional domain, how have these taxa changed through time? So we're we're going to stick again with this BC thing, and I'm just going to pick the top twenty records or the top twenty like taxonomic types. So here I'm again taking the taxa from all the sites. I only want the ones that are trees and shrubs. I only want the ones that are pollen. And I only want the ones that are pollen counts rather than like some other measurement. So maybe someone counted them in uh, grains per cubic centimeter or something like that. So I want I want all these to be sort of like uh, elements. And so maybe there's other, you know, maybe there are other things you want to choose. Simon? Yes. Uh, how is percentage calculated in Rioja from total? That one, I don't know. Yeah, it's it's calculated. Uh, no, I think we say in this Rioja that the values are percent. Yeah, so it says scale percent. So in this case, it knows that. Um, it, sorry, it does. It's not. It's not saying that this is. It doesn't know that it's percent. It just like. I, I'm just saying that it is percent. So I'm taking those proportions, I'm multiplying them by 100 so that it is a percentage value, and then I'm just applying the X label that is percent. And then I think the scale percent is telling Rioja that these are percent values. So when it's doing the weighted averaging, it, it knows. Okay. And where did you tell it what it's a percentage of what this pollen stone is? It doesn't. It it just knows that the values that are coming in from this table should actually sum to 100. Got it. Because I because I'm giving it this flag scale percent. Mm -hmm. So I did, I mean that like I did all this uh, proportional stuff up here, turning it into proportions. And this too wide function knows that if the operation is prop, it is summing by row. And so then when it goes into uh, Rioja, I, because I want that X value to, to show as like zero to 100 so that it's percentages, I need to tell it that that these are actually percentage values and not just counts or whatever. Is there a smooth way uh, in your way to calculate proportions to uh, tell it to drop things like aquatics? Or is it just going to be proportional that's, to everything? Yeah. So in here, that's so this one is it was actually just doing proportions of trees and shrubs. So I could say like uh, a QVP is aquatic vascular plants. Uh, and I could do um, UP, uh, what is it? UPHE is upland heath, upland herbs, sorry. So you could do, so you can choose what it is that you are, you can like choose the ecological groups or you can choose, yeah, the ecological groups that are being used for your pollen sum. Great, thanks. That's fantastically a lot easier than I have been doing. <laughs> yeah, and and I mean, you can, uh, you could in this samples, uh, like if there are things you want to specifically exclude, 
you can add like a filter here where you could say like a variable name. Uh, so let's say for whatever reason, you don't want Pinus in there. You could just add that. Uh, well, yeah, so for, yeah, anyway. So there, there are other options, like you can do pre-filtering. So this samples table is just giving you that long table. And so you can do other filtering if you want, like maybe, I mean, for whatever reason, maybe you want to uh, remove like age is, uh, you want everything uh, in the last 10,000 years only. You can do that as well. Okay. So, all right. So, uh, I need, I definitely need to edit <laughs> the text a bit better. Okay. So, we now have site information across uh, British Columbia. Hey, Simon. Yeah. And so, if you've, you know, We've got this plot of interest and it looks great, you know, the, and so we're happy with it. Um, and let's say at this point we want to export it um, into where we could insert it into a Word document, for example, or, yeah. and, or is there a way to dress it up? Like, is there a way to export it in a format that can be altered once you've exported it? Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if Rio, I don't know if anyone's used the Rio. Oh, that's not great. Um, I don't know if Rioja has a direct way of doing it, but um, there is, so there's a few ways. So if I, oh, if I just type plot here, oh, oh, that's crazy. Sorry. So if I plot it out here, there is this export. Uh, so in our studio, you can directly export mm -hmm. and you can save it as an image. Right. Um, and one of those image options is like SVG, which is sometimes what I would use in this case, because then it like you could edit it in Illustrator or something like that. Um, there's other ways of doing these plots. So some people use like ggplot as well. Um, you would do it a little differently. You'd have to sort of do some manual editing, but um, you could do that as well. Uh, and I, I'm not sure if Rioja has a way. Uh, strap on. Let's just see. It's got a lot of options. So it it doesn't look like it's got a way of saving it. Yeah, I don't, I don't see a way of saving it in Rioja, um, but like it's got a lot of different uh, options for like making you know you can use polygons instead of line plots that kind of stuff um and then ultimately yeah you can export the image uh, you can zoom and you can copy the image you can you know whatever the r has lots of different opportunities to save things and we could probably add a vignette on like plotting and saving so that's great. My, uh, the students won't have, you know, un, most likely won't have access to um, Illustrator. Yeah, so I think we actually have some licenses in our computer lab. So, so maybe if they're, if so, they're true, but that's a whole learning curve in and of itself. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so I, I mean, I, I really don't need them to spend too much too much time on that. I was just wondering, like for example, the vertical axis, you know, over yeah, units, right, and just a way to yeah. Get well, so out. that's so part of that is the fact that it's like. Uh, is because it's trying to fit it into a relatively small space. And so as you zoom, 
that makes a difference. But also, if you look at the help for the Rioja package, there are um, there are a bunch of different features that you can sort of play around with, like these CEX features that change the character size. Right. So, like CEX, X label, CEX, Y label, those kinds of things. So. Okay, so uh, buh, 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 let me just close that up. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is we want to go and and do this sort of like I am interested. Oops, I am interested in the change in taxa regionally over time because that tells me something about the regional climate and and that kind of thing. Um, there are there are two different workflows that we're going to show. Uh, following one another. One is sort of just like regional change over time that is actually relatively straightforward, but um, with the samples thing. The other one um, may be of interest to people as well, where we're actually going to go and we're going to show the distributions of the taxa in climate space. So we're going to map it against climate as well. So this all relies on the fact, again, that we have this download object, in this case, I'm calling it BCDL, that has the site information, the data set information, the chronologies, and the samples all pulled in. So we've, we've run through get sites, we've run through get data sets, and then we run through get downloads to get this whole object together. So to summarize by time, again, I'm going to choose taxa. Uh, so I'm going to choose the taxa that I want to display. I want, I'm going to display in this case only trees and shrubs. I could add upland herbs if I want to. Um, there's other types and you can see those when you list the taxa. I'm going to only choose the pollen again, and I'm only going to choose the number of identified specimens. I'm going to arrange it by the number of sites that things appear in, and I'm going to choose only the 20 most frequent sites, uh, the 20 most frequent taxa. And so if I do that, I'm just running through everything. It's pulling out all the different taxa. And so I can go to plotting taxa. And here is the top 20. You can see again, like whatever. So again, I didn't group these. You can see that there's that issue. Uh, okay, so here what I'm gonna do is I am going to take all my samples. I am only gonna take the ones whose variable name is in this variable name column of the ver of the variable I just created. So plotting taxa variable name is the table of the top 20 most frequent taxa. And so I'm going to say in my samples, I only want the ones whose variable name is, is in there. Then I'm going to group them by age. Uh, and I'm going to do this thing <laughs> where I, um, so I, I don't know if you've ever done this. This is a way of uh, grouping things into 500 year time bins. So I'm taking the age and multiplying it by two. I'm rounding it to three decimal, uh, negative three decimal places. So I'm multiplying it by two. Round, grouping it into thousands and then dividing by two again. And so that gives me like these 500 year time bins. And then I'm saying N is the number of unique sites that I get. So let's group this. And so if I look at what this table looks like, Uh, so what this table looks like is I have the variable name, the age bin, and then the number or the length of unique site IDs in that age bin.
So taxa by age, if we look at it, oh, where is it? Taxa by age, we've gone from having these 15,000 records. We've grouped them into these 500 year time bins and we have a table of 1400 rows and three variables, variable name, age, and N, which is the number of sites that these appear at. So that's taxa by age. Now, if I want to know the proportion of sites that each taxon appears at, I need to also group to get the number of sites that we have in each age bin, because it, you know, it's, it, there is this pull of the present. It's very likely that we have fewer sites the further back in time we go. And so if we look at uh, samples by age, you'll see that in the present, we have 52 sites. 500 years before present, we have 53 sites. Uh, 50 sites with a thousand with samples in 1000, the 1000 year time bin, 53, 52, yada, yada, yada. And so we're going to join taxa by age to samples by age. And we're going to create a column called proportion that is the number of sites that a sample appears in divided by the number of samples in that time bin. And so here what you see is this is the result of joining those because they both have a column called age that overlaps. And so we have variable name, age, and n from this samples by age table. We've joined this samples column from the, sorry, uh, variable name, age, and n are from taxa by age. This samples column and age were in samples by age. And then we have the proportion, which is in this case, 45 ABs appears in 45 sites in that age zero time bin. And there are 52 total sites in that time bin. So ABs is at 80% of sites in that time bin. So again, we are choosing the taxa we want. We're saying, I only want the 20 most common taxa. I am figuring out how many sites they appear in, in each 500 year time bin. Then I'm figuring out how many sites there actually are in each 500 year time bin. And I am joining those two different tables together and getting the proportion of sites at which each taxon appears in within each 500 year time bin. Then I do a complicated plot, <laughs> but I will show you, oh. What was going on there? Oh, okay. There. Just a lot of here. Uh, okay, here we go. And so here's the plot. So ABs. So you can see age is going from 20,000 years on the left-hand side to the present on the right-hand side. Uh, so time is going in this direction. And what we see is that for most of these sites, we're always seeing 
Abe's pollen um, throughout time. We see an increase in Q Cresaceae. It's, I don't know if that's statistically significant, uh, an increase in Betula, uh, a decrease in pine, and a very strong increase in uh, Western hemlock. So, I mean, in general, this sort of matches with what we might expect. Uh, we did not lump together all the different pines. And so that might change things. Um, but this gives us a sense of some of the things that might be going on in this region. One of the limitations of this is, if you remember, early on, we sort of defined a spatial boundary for our sites, and that probably strongly affects the fact whether or not we see a pattern here. Um, because we're covering, I mean, these sites that I chose cover both coastal and interior um, in the Pacific Northwest in North America, which saw different uh, climatic changes and have different dominant taxa through time. So just something to keep in mind. Ah. But <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm going to say that this is relatively quick and easy. Um, I, I, again, understand that this, uh, this formatting in this code may take some time to get used to, but having said that, really this plot, uh, which is effectively fairly complicated, um, it, it really only took, you know, I, how many lines of code am I selecting here? 12. It, it really only took like 30 lines of code total to do from start to finish. Um, and this is something that that prior to this would have taken quite a bit longer. So we are able to do some pretty straightforward analyses in a very short time. I'm going to close that down. Um, there's some other stuff in here, like these smooths. So we, you know, you can take a lot of this stuff out. Uh, I don't have to use GAMs. Um, I was using them to be fancy. <laughs> but you can use local smoothing. And, you know, see the patterns still there. It's just a question of the uncertainties that are mapped on them. And you can do more or less filtering. You can group things differently. You can do all of that kind of stuff in uh, using this package. OK, uh, so the next part is sort of similar. Um, we are again, so what we want to do this time is we're taking, uh, oops, we're, ah. so what we're going to do in this next one is we're going to take all of the most recent samples. And I'm, I'm cheating a little bit. I'm, I'm just going to take all samples within the last 1,000 years uh, and pretend like climate hasn't changed too much over the last 1,000 years. I'm, again, only going to take the trees and shrubs. I'm only going to take the pollen. I'm only going to take the number of individual uh, samples. And I'm going to turn it into a spatial object. Because what I want to do is I'm going to use the raster package in R to pull in data, global climate data, with the annual maximum with with the monthly maximum temperature and i am going to then do an intercept between my samples data which is now geo coded and this climate raster and i'm going to choose the intercept on the seventh month which is july so what i'm doing is i'm taking uh 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get for every single sample the maximum July temperature associated with that spatial location. So, oh, I, that's why. Okay. So first here, I'm getting this thing that I'm calling modern. I can choose, I mean, this is, this is for illustrative purposes. <laughs> um, you know, in this case, what you might want to do is instead of choosing these cores, you could choose the uh, data set. So you could do a download of the data set type uh, pollen surface sample, right? Um, so when, when you're in this process of creating this BCDL object, which is the downloads that we did, instead of filtering for pollen, you can choose pollen surface sample or you could choose all pollen and pollen surface samples and take everything that has a modern age. So I've taken this modern, I've filtered and filtered twice. So made sure that all the ages are less than a thousand years old and they are trees and shrubs, they are pollen and they are counted using the number of individual uh, specimens. And so you can see here, I could view this if I wanted to. I get these ages. And I have columns, wherever they are, with the latitude and the longitude. So everything is spatially, um, is represented spatially. In R, I then need to convert that into uh, an explicitly spatial object. And so I'm using this SF package. This is simple features. This is sort of now, it, it used to be there were a bunch of different R packages for spatial data. I think in general, SF is sort of the, the one that is recognized as the most, uh, as, as sort of the, the cornerstone of spatial operations in R. I am defining a projection. So I'm saying this is a longitude latitude projection. Uh, it's using uh, the WGS84 datum. So this is telling the, the data set, the curvature of the earth to use basically. Um, and I'm telling it the columns that I want it to use. So I could uh, plot spatial, but I'm not going to, but this is now a spatial object. And you can see here's all the points. Uh, so the raster package has a function called get data. Um, we can take a look at it. Uh, raster has been replaced, uh, in R now by a package called Terra, but, um, we're going to use it here because Terra doesn't have this get data function. So if you look at the different options, there's the GADM, which is like a global administrative units. Um, there's an altitude uh, table. Uh, there's world CLIM that you can get. There's CMIP5 if you want future climate data. There's, there's a bunch of different options uh, that you have in terms of what you want to pull. So I am getting world CLIM. I am getting the maximum temperature parameter, and I'm getting a resolution of 10 arc minutes. So it's actually going to go in and download this data. And it's going to put it into this variable world Tmax. I can plot world uh, Tmax if I want to, and it'll pop up on this panel once it decides to actually, there you go. And so here's like, Maximum temperature in January, February, March, April, May, June, da, 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 da. You can see these values go from minus 400 to positive 400. That seems very uh, large, or it may seem very large to you. Um, World Clim and a lot of other climate data packages multiply their temperatures by 10 so that they can store them as integers rather than floating point data sets. So just be aware of that, that the temperature is actually a multiple of 10. It's not in degrees Kelvin. Well, it couldn't be because they're negative values. Anyway, whatever. Okay. Then I do this function called extract and extract basically says, give me a raster and give me a set of spatial points. 
and I will give you a table. And I am just taking that seventh column, which is the July temperature, and I am adding it to my spatial object. So if I type spatial now, what you'll see is I've got uh, this whole data object with all of this information, the variable name, the ages, da 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 da. I have the geometry, which tells me that it's a spatial object, and then I have this uh, maximum July temperature. So this is the maximum July temperature at this location where I find this taxon, whatever it is. Where so like. Betula at this location is experiencing a maximum July temperature of 25.2. So I'm doing a bunch of changes here. So I have all these taxa. Um, and what I've decided to do is, again, a kind of lazy fix. I'm basically saying any kind of punctuation, replace it with a space. So, uh, for example, this Laric Pseudosuga, this is actually, this is why it's kind of lazy. Uh, basically, this Laric Pseudosuga, I'm replacing that uh, slash with a space. Um, but it's letting me do things like if I just found Pinus type, it would replace that dash as well with a space. Well, it, it, it will. And then for all of these variable names, go in split it into words and give me only the first word. So what this will do is it will make sure that this Pinus undiff just turns into Pinus. Suga heterophila, well, I'm lumping all the Suga. It's, like I said, it's really lazy. You shouldn't do it this way, but we just want to uh, do it really simply. And then I want to group by the variable name and the site so that we are just getting each one once. Then when you're grouping these things all together, just take the maximum July temperature for each taxon, give me the variable name, and then filter uh, for things that appear at least three times in the data set. Uh, I think I explain all of that there. Uh, oh, there's some dogs going crazy outside. Then I want to just get the maximum temperatures, and then I'm going to plot it out. So this is not the best explanation. I apologize. But what you will see now is, right, so what So what we're actually going to try to do, oh, sorry, i got to copy and paste that. So what we're actually doing here is, uh, is kind of neat, I think. So the black line is the background distribution of maximum July temperatures in British Columbia. So you'll see it is the same for every panel. The red line is the distribution of maximum July temperatures for that particular taxon. So what we see is that things like Acer, so maples, do not appear at the coldest sites in this region. They're sort of, and they, they don't appear as much in the warmest sites in the region. They're really concentrated in this sort of mid-range maximum July temperature. The Ericales, uh, the Ericaceous shrubs, appear more frequently at the colder sites. Uh, Taxus, the ewes, are more common in the warmer sites. And then a lot of these other things sort of are just in the middle. Juniper is, is much more frequent at the hotter sites. This Pinaceae, I was people who were unable to differentiate between spruce and pine. Um, yeah, and so that's that's sort of it. 
So we're able to go from, you know, doing our site selection to mapping changes in climate over time. Uh, we can use this same approach if you're doing like uh, transfer functions, uh, because we can, again, like uh, we can get the modern pollen samples using a get downloads for a set of data that is pollen surface samples or whatever it is that we're looking for, diatom surface samples. We can map them, those locations to climate. And we can, again, apply, we can, we can use transfer functions. And so I think that's sort of where this conclusion ends. Um, we are only going to 11.30. Uh, so there is uh, in this same folder or in the same workshop thing, a document called complex workflow. I'll put that in the chat. Oh, that's in the chat. Uh, okay, so that's there as well. And you can, um, so this deals more with working with chronologies. So we can change the chronologies that we use for the individual records if you want. Um, there's lots of different reasons why we might want to do that. If we're doing uh, analysis for a large number of records, we may want to, you know, rerun all of the chronologies using something like Decron or Bacon. Um, this shows you how to add in new chronologies and, and use them. Um, but I'm not going to work through that because we don't have too much time. Um, and that's it. So that's, that's it. Um, so I'm going to, oh, yeah. So, uh, so Natalia is asking, is it possible to use other climate data? Yes. So all you need to do is have that data as a raster. That's that's it. So we were using um, we we were using the World Klim data set because uh, in this instance you can download it right from the web, and all of us would be able to use it, and we wouldn't I wouldn't have to be sharing TIFF files. But as long as you have that climate data in some sort of grid or raster file format. You can just read it into R and use that extract function to, to line things up. Uh, and if you have specific questions about a specific data product, we can work through that as well. If you wanna just get in touch, I'm happy to help. Any other questions or? I just want to say how awesome this has been. I mean, I see that this is kind of like just getting in to it really. And then once, once you're in it, they're the, probably limitless really in terms of the types of analyses you can do. Um, well, maybe not limitless, but lots of options, but this has been just great. Like I, I personally feel much more able uh, to navigate it compared to when everything was separate before. Uh, and having them all integrated like this is, uh, is really exceptional. There, there, there are other elements to this. So um, I didn't show it, but there, there are functions. So all of our data sets in Neotoma now have DOIs um, so that they are uniquely citable objects. And it is possible to get those all, um, I think just using DOIs, right? 
Let me just run that. Just check. Oh. Oh, it's DOI. So if you uh, if you just type DOI BC DL, um, you'll see all the unique data set DOI. So there's there's a push for like citing data properly. And so I think this is something we want to really do for the researchers who have contributed data to Neotoma. All the data sets have DOIs. And so ideally people should be citing those now properly and we can actually track their use across the web. Um, so I, I think just to have people, you know, show the impact of their research. Um, the, there are other pieces and yeah, like this is, you know, three hours. There's so much stuff that people want to do with their data sets. Uh, and I think that's part of the reason that Socorro and I, we have that Slack um, and I'll pull that link in. Da, 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 if I can find it. Oh, here we go. Um, so uh, for those of you that do use Slack, uh, that is a link um, and you are more than welcome to join there and ask questions. Uh, we're very happy to help. I mean, a lot of my job now is just to help people get things done properly. So um, that's what we're here for. Thanks so much. Yeah, no problem. I'm I'm gonna. Oh, Natalia, did you have a question or? I I just want to say that yeah, thank you very much. And now we have to practice because. Yeah. Yeah. Right now, I just I just can see and try to understand, and then when you send us the record, maybe after that we can. Yeah, absolutely. It's that, yeah. It's it's a lot to take in all at once. So, and this was this was shorter than normal. So, um, I'm gonna stop the recording. I will. Uh, I'm gonna just grab some something to drink, but I will stay on for. I like I don't have anything for the next 40 minutes. So I will stay on if people want to talk more specifically about particular issues or questions or whatever. So just so that it's not uh, actually recording. So thank you very much, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have feedback, comments, questions, things we could do better, uh, more than happy to hear it. Thank you, Simon. Yeah, thanks thank again. You. Take care.